Hey, so um, last week we talked about, uh, I just felt like we needed a reminder based on maybe just, just normal things that we encounter throughout, throughout our life. Just, you know, if you ever watch the news, it just, uh, we, we're losing our minds all over the place all the time. Last week we just started a two-part series last week because we got done with the book of Philippians. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you, if you miss some of those parts in Philippians, go back online uh, watch all that through. It was very encouraging to me. It was uh, challenging to me. But last week we started a two-part series. Basically, I entitled it "Who's in Charge?" because we needed a reminder: who's actually in charge? Because what happens is, is we we go through this twelve-part series on joy, and then we step into this, you know, this. We leave that. We leave that setting, and then we're like, "Well, okay, great." And we needed a reminder. We need a reminder that Jesus is still in charge. As I was thinking about who's in charge, just that title today, uh, you know, I was uh, reviewing some of the stuff for tonight. Um, I've, I've, this week, I've been thinking about different leaders throughout history. And I don't know if you're a student of history. Some of you think history is the most boring thing on the planet. But as I was thinking through some great leaders in in history. Some of the great leaders in history that you studied, you put a little, you put a little report together in your in your class. You know all about these people, right? People like Winston Churchill and people like Julius Caesar, where many people say many historians consider Julius Caesar to be like the greatest military commander in history. Many many consider that. Um, if you've never heard anything about the leader, the great leader in South Africa, Nelson Mandela, who did some amazing things during that apartheid season of of the racial tension in in that, in that place, in that time. That was not too far removed from us today. And then you can read of the great leader Gandhi, who was this nonviolent leader in India that led uh, to independence from British rule. Napoleon Bonaparte. You've maybe seen a movie or heard stories about Bonaparte. Abraham Lincoln. Martin Luther, the great reformer. Martin Luther King Jr. Genghis Khan. I'm not, I'm not saying these people were like always sweet people, but they were, they were strong leaders, and they led well. People followed them. They listened to them because they were in charge of a movement, of a group, of something that changed the world. Alexander the Great, Ben Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt, George Washington. There's so many, and you can read books, and there's movies. I, was, um, I did a little Google search, like movies based on great leaders, and they're just a long list. I'm like, those are really good movies. Some of those, I'm like, man, that's a good movie about a coach. It's a sports movie. It's about a coach. He's a good leader, and you can learn some things like that. So we understand, we understand leadership from that perspective of we can see a really good leader. Like when we, when we know a good leader, we, we can see a good leader. And a leader's in charge. And so we asked the question last week, who's in charge? Well, who's in charge is the leader. And I submit to you again, as I did last week, that Jesus is in charge. He has supreme, absolute authority over every square inch of the globe. He's in charge. And as I was looking through lists of leaders, I don't know if you ever do this. I, I, I find myself chasing rabbit that leads to another rabbit that goes down a hole that leads to another hole. And um, I found a list that, and it's voted upon. People rank it of like the greatest leaders of all time. Moses was on there, and some of the ones that I listed. The number one pick. And it was thousands upon thousands of people that got to vote. Jesus Christ was the number one pick in that list. So maybe the world does know that Jesus is a good leader. So we're going to rem remind ourselves again that he has authority. Last week we talked about how Jesus has authority over disease. We talked about Jesus has authority over his followers, the disciples. We talked about how Jesus has authority over disaster. I have a good friend of mine that's in, uh, he's a pat planted a church in Naples, Florida. Um, if you know anything about what's happening over there right now, it's not real great. Really close to Fort Myers. Fort Myers is trashed. And so I reached out to him. I said, hey, how's it going? He said, there's a lot of damage over here, but the church shines brightest in seasons like this. And he said he brought a team over to, I, I, I was in Gulfport during Katrina, and it was rough. And the church shines bright through that. So Jesus has authority over disaster. Talk about Jesus has authority over demons. We looked at all that through Matthew 8. Tonight we're going to be in Matthew 9, still talking about who's in charge, still looking at Jesus and how he's in charge. Now, if you, if you read back through, I hope I, I challenged you last week to, to read Matthew 8 and 9. There's story after story 
right? You, you get my challenge? Remember that? Read it every day, Matthew 8 and 9, every day for a couple of weeks while we're in this. And you see story after story of Jesus encountering something and him, in a way, flexing his authority over that situation. And we see his supreme rule, his supreme reign. And we're going to look at it again tonight in Matthew chapter 9. First thing, Jesus is in charge of forgiveness. Jesus is in charge of forgiveness. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Matthew 9. Matthew 9, 1 through 8. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, if, if I said that to somebody on the street, uh, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. You know, there's, I, I've been around Gulfport for, for a while. I've known some of the... We have, there's a few beggars that are in and out. I've known some of them by name. I've been out to their tents in the woods and gotten to know them. I don't really advise that. That might not be real safe for a lot of people. Um, but if I were to say to somebody that's laying in the street paralyzed, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. I don't think anybody would care. And so Jesus says, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes, now these are religious leaders, they understand Jesus' reputation he rocks the boat. He says some things. It's very offensive. Well, this was offensive to them. The scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. And so you've got, you got to understand, when you read through the stories of the Gospels of Jesus' life and ministry that ultimately led to his death, like brutal public slaughter, and he was a great, fantastic man, there was something going on that led people in, that were in charge, so to speak, with the authority that God gave them that led them to crucify Jesus it's because of the things not not really the things that he did but the when he did them because he was breaking the sabbath according to their tradition and the things that he was he was saying and they thought this is blasphemous nobody can talk like that the only person who can talk like that is somebody that actually has the authority of God and I'm going to tell you again Jesus is in charge and he can say the things that he says but Jesus knowing their thoughts said why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Now, that's a good question. The answer, it's easier to tell somebody your sins are forgiven. That's the answer if you knew. I don't know if, you, if you're like, I don't know. What is easier to say? But the, that you may know that the Son of Man, that's a term, that's a title that Jesus gives himself most often in the Gospels. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins that only God has, only God can forgive sins. So Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. They're like, oh, 22nd time out. You can't say that, man. You can't go there. Like, that's horribly blasphemous. And he says, okay, so that you know that I have the authority to say that, here's what I'm going to do. And then he looks at this paralyzed man. He says, rise up, take your mat, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and he went home. And the crowd saw it. They were afraid. I don't know what... So a lot of times you're reading the Gospels, people are either terrified or they're rejoicing. A lot of people that get healed, they're excited. They're not, the, the guy that gets up for the first time in his life, he, he's probably not terrified. He's pretty excited. They were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to man, to Jesus. So this, the, the root of all of your suffering in this life, some of you feel like you're suffering for something, various reasons. The root of all of your suffering in this life is sin. In all of life, in my life, in all of the world, the root of that is sin. The need in my life and in your life, in all of the world, is a spiritual need. And that's Jesus. Jesus meets that spiritual need. The forgiveness of sins. That's what this man needed. Jesus goes to this man who was paralyzed, and he looked at him and says, I know what this guy needs. This guy needs forgiveness of sins. And this guy was probably like, I don't know. I might need something else. And he, and he received the forgiveness of sins. And that's the good news of the kingdom. Not that Jesus will heal you of every problem that you have and every sickness that you have, but that Jesus will forgive you of all your sins. Because you can be sick in this in, in all of life, 
with terrible disease and sickness. You can take that all through life and be a believer full of faith. And when you come to the place where you breathe your last on this earth, you will step into glory, into the presence of Jesus himself because your sins are forgiven. Your spirit is whole. That's way more important. That's not always what everybody wants. But the forgiveness of sin is God's greatest gift and it meets our greatest need. My greatest need, your greatest need is spiritual. And Jesus has authority over that. Jesus has authority right now in this moment to whisper to your broken heart, your sins are forgiven, my son, my child. Your sins are forgiven. And you can receive that forgiveness. You can be beaten up and battered and maybe paralyzed spiritually. And Jesus can look at you even in this moment. Your sins are forgiven. We got to come to him. We got to look to him for forgiveness. In Christ, there is forgiveness. And he takes our guilt. And he takes that. And we give him our shame. He takes our sin. And then we, we give him our shame. And there's no guilt. There's no shame because there's no condemnation. Because there's no sin held against us. Because Jesus took all, all of it upon himself. Because only Jesus has the authority to forgive. Jesus is in charge of forgiveness. The next thing is Jesus is in charge of salvation. It just picks right back up in Matthew 9, 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. These were foul people. These were the people that nobody wanted to be around. They were crooks. They were wicked, evil. They did bad things publicly. And Jesus is hanging out with them. All these tax collectors. Jesus is reclining at the table. And these religious people, he's uptight, Stiff Pharisees. It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't he realize that they're, they're foul? Doesn't he realize that they're, they're a plague to our community? Doesn't he realize that the way that they think their worldview is, is off? They're stealing from people? I mean, in the mean, in the mean, meanwhile, we're tithing out of our spice rack and our shirts are tucked in all the time and we're doing everything perfect and you're hanging out with these wicked people. They had a problem with Jesus hanging out with these people. (laughs) I love Jesus' response. When he heard it, he said to them, those who are well, they don't need a doctor. People who are sick. He's talking about spiritual needs. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. Jesus is talking about self-righteousness. Jesus is talking about people... Uh, being good enough in their own strength, in their own will, so they think they're okay with God. That's not these tax collectors. That's not these sinners that Jesus is hanging out reclining with. Jesus, he has complete authority over salvation. People that need salvation. Jesus pursues sinners. So if you're, if you're a believer in here, if you're saved by grace... Jesus, you were the tax collector. You were the one that were, you were doing the scumbag, wicked things that you were, you're used to doing. And Jesus pursued you. He found you. He called you. He says, I'm going to come recline at your table. And then he satisfies you with salvation. More than sick people need a doctor. Sinful people need a redeemer. And that's Jesus. He's the only one that has any type of authority to do that. Because he's in charge of salvation. We all need salvation. Jesus is the one who's in charge of that. The next thing. Jesus is in charge of the future. Tomorrow. Days ahead. You know, there's going to be troubled, troubling times in your future. There just will be. I'm not being Johnny Rain Cloud. It's just true. The older I get, the more I feel older. The more I know, the the older I get, I'm going to feel even more older. And things are going to happen. The news feed that's going to scroll across the bottom, that might might be rough. I don't know what next storm is going to hit. I remember Katrina. 
We're going to have another one of those babies come wipe us out. I don't know. I'm just being realistic. Because here's what I know. I don't know a lot, but what I do know is that there's, there's, a, there's a king of the universe that has absolute authority over the future. Like complete sovereign rule over the future. So if that is true, if Jesus has complete authority over the future, please tell me, what gives me the right to stress and worry about anything in my future? Anything. So when I stress and when I worry about what's not or what might be something down the road tomorrow, when I take those worries and those stresses and anxieties, whether it's with work, family, school, whatever, what I'm doing is I'm taking the authority that Jesus has over the future, my future, I'm saying, I don't know about all that. I'm slipping in my faith. And if I'm realistic and I'm just honest with you, I find myself doing that sometimes. I find myself sometimes slipping into that moment of despair, worrying about the future, worrying about how something's going to work out. Some of you in this room right now, you're looking at something in your life right now, and you're like, I don't know how this is going to work out. And you're like, I don't, I don't see it. There's been so many times in my life where I'm looking at something in front of me, and I'm like, this ain't going to work out. Like, even planting a church. I remember there were times, like, we're not, we're, not, we're not real old as a church. Like, we're coming up, like, about four years. I don't know if some of y'all knew this. But there have been times in the past with Harbor City Church where I'm like, God, are you sure about this? I was telling somebody the other day that, about how Hurricane COVID wiped out our facility. And it did. We were meeting in a school. And the Hurricane COVID came through and wiped out our facility. Like, people were, like, gathering back in their facilities, and we're like, we can't really go back to it. We don't, like, we lost it. It's wiped out down to the slab. And there were times where, like, God, are you sure about this? And there were times in this journey of planting a church, I remember that, like, seeing some lines that we crossed. And, like, okay, this is kind of a point of no return. <laughs> okay, I'm going to step over this line and, like, I'm sticking my neck out on the line. Like, okay, this is what... This is what you've called us to do. God, you're in charge of the future. And I don't know what the future looks like for our church. I'm going to be around 10, 15, 20 years from now. We could be in this building, this facility, 20 years from now. The whole place. There could be a big Harbor City Church sign on the outside. We could have a couple of services. We could have all kinds of crazy people running around here. Do, you know, all kinds of sinners and tax collectors like yourself. Loving Jesus, loving each other. I don't know what the future looks like. I know that Jesus is in charge of the future. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, look in verse 14 of Matthew 9. Why do, why do we, so this is John's disciples. They, 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 they're seeing Jesus' disciples do some, act a little bit differently in certain ways than John's disciples. Says, why, why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples, they never, they don't fast. They do not fast. So fasting is something that's been confusing for a lot of people throughout, you know, the centuries. I hear people often say, I'm going to be, I'm going to go on a, like, a week-long fast. And I, I want to talk to you. I want, I, want, I want you to tell me about that because I want to, I want to help you, okay? If you feel like you want to fast about something, then that's great. Let's talk about that. I've done it before. It can be excruciating, and it can be one of the most amazing things you can ever experience. He says, why do, you, why, do, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said to them, can, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? <laughs> like, well, you're not at a funeral, you're at a wedding. Like, I'm here. The, day, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment. And a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into wine, old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled out and it's wasted and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, so both are preserved. Now, sometimes people look at this passage and like, can I like make a lesson about wine with this or fasting with this or the? So here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying like, look, 
Everybody else is fasting and longing and craving and wanting God to be in their presence and in their midst to restore things, to fix things, to be very near. Jesus says, my disciples don't fast because I'm here. I'm with them. I'm camping out with them every day. We wake up together and have breakfast. There's no reason for them to be longing and craving for a whole lot because their creator is breathing the same air that they're breathing. So that's when we say, like, we, we, have to, we have to realize that Jesus is completely in charge of the future. So why Jesus' disciples, they didn't fast. So there were, for thousands of years, God's people were waiting for their king to show up, and the king finally was here. Because Jesus has control over the past, the present, and the future. This longing, this craving, this expectation, well, it was there, it was with them. Then we ask ourselves a question. So why do they not fast then? Because the king was with them. Why do disciples of Jesus fast now? Those who celebrate the ascension of the king now crave the complete completion of the kingdom. So when you fast, fasting is a time of, of longing. It's feasting on God as you separate something of this life. It's craving, hoping for more of God, longing for more of, more of him, feasting on him. More of God, more of God, less of me, less of me. Why? Because there's something in the future when Jesus is going to make it all right. So here's what, you know, just a side note. We'll get back to this. I'd love to have a conversation with you. If you're fasting, if you say, I'm going to fast because you want God to, like, be stronger in a certain area of your life, I think, we're, I think you might be missing the, po the point of fasting. If you're fasting because you want, like, God to really pay attention to your prayer, I think maybe you're missing the point of prayer. When you fast... It's because you're hoping and longing for more of Jesus in your life. And in, you, in, in doing that, you're craving for the kingdom that will come because he is in absolute control of the future. Whenever I worry, I've slipped into despair about whatever, it's because I have forgotten that Jesus is in charge of my future. And so what you need to do, some of you worry warts, some of you people who are worried about something coming up, or you're just anxious. You might find yourself just, just like a, like there's this lump or this knot that just kind of rests on you all the time of something that's you can't control and it hasn't happened yet. You need to be reminded that Jesus is in charge of the future. Fast, crave more of Him, long for more of Him, hope for more of Him. If you fast, make your fast focus on more of Jesus, not something more from His hand. More of Him. And we could talk more about that. Might be some people that think differently about that. It's a, it's a fun thing to talk about. The next thing. Jesus is in charge of death. And this is so good. These two chapters are so full of amazing just moments in the life and ministry of Jesus. While he was saying these things to them, as he's beginning to, he's, he's still speaking about the wine skin and all this stuff. And I think people are, most people in that day are like understanding the garment and the wineskin thing. Like, like we can get that, but we don't have a lot of hands-on experience with like wineskins busting in our kitchen. But they get it. So as he's communicating this, and most people are like, what? What's, what's he, is he talking about like now, the future? While he was saying these things, verse 18, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died. But come, lay your hand on her, and she will live. Wow. He said, come, lay your hand on my daughter. She's dead. Jesus rose. Why? Because he was reclining. And he followed him with his disciples. Can you imagine being in that moment? Jesus is kicked back with all the crazy, wacky, drunk tax collectors. Somebody comes in and falls at his feet and says, my daughter's dead. Can you do something about that? Silence in the room, right? Jokes are being said, laughter, silence. Now everybody's like, and Jesus gets up. I don't know about you, but if I'm in that party, the party's over. The funeral song just started playing, the party's over. There's a guy that came in, interrupted the party, and said, Hey, my daughter's dead. Help. Jesus gets up, rose, stands up. I'm following this crowd now. I want to see what happens. 
My daughter just died. But come lay her hand on her, she'll live. Man, what faith. Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years. So this huge crowd of people are come through. And this woman who's, who'd suffered from this, this blood issue. In, in this story in the book of Luke, because Luke is a doctor, it, it mentions that she suffered from many physicians. I don't know if Luke put that in there on purpose. But anyway, he says, um, he suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years, came up behind him, and pressing through the crowd, touched the fringe of his garment. In her faith, she's like, I'm suffering. If I can just get pushed through whatever this mess is in all of my life, I, if I can just push through and try to touch Jesus. And he t she touched Jesus, the, the, the fringe of his garment. And she, for she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her and said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Back to what happened a while ago. And when, the, when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players, the crowd making commotion, the funeral song is playing. Everybody's sad. He said, go away. Leave. Get out of here. This girl, she's not dead. She's sleeping. That's rude, y'all. That is so rude. The, the rudest thing anybody in our culture could ever do is interrupt a funeral and say, y'all get out of here. They're just napping. That would be the worst thing that I've, if I did that, it would be the worst thing that I've ever done in my life. He shows up, busts in a beard, says, hey, stop the song. Whoop, sh shuts, shuts the flute playing up. Like, that's not, that's not, that's not that great. <laughs> Everybody get out of here. She's taking a nap. Man, that's offensive. Here's this, this father that's, that's, that's bringing this commotion of these people following Jesus. Go away, he says. The girl's not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed at him. They, they started laughing. Some people in that room, if it were you, you would be offended. You'd be like, what a, what a cruel thing to do right now. And some people, maybe because they were at an earlier party, maybe they're laughing because this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and he took her by her hand. She's dead. Jesus knows it. They know it. It's not like she's a real hard sleeper. It's not like Jesus has like this, like a certain whistle that can wake anybody that's napping. She's dead. He took her by her hand. She rose. Jesus has authority over death. I'm not saying that you go to a funeral and tell people to leave. Don't do that. You might get arrested. It's a bad idea. But what I'm saying is that Jesus has authority over death. One of the things that you can do is you can do a little study about what terrifies people the most. And one of the things that is at the top of the list is people are scared to die. What we don't have, we don't have any, you know, if, you, if some of you have been on trips to cool places and you come back and you tell us about it and you show us pictures, we don't really have anything like that. Tell me what it was like dying. You were gone for a few years and you came back. What's it like over there? There's so much unknown to it. There's so much about death that just, it freaks people out. It really does. It really does. And I've been in, in some sweet moments in people who have walked with Jesus for decades. And they're at the end of their time. And people have, that love them have said, hey, you guys got to. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta come on, y'all gotta come in. And this person that's been walking with Jesus for 50, 60 something years, they have this peace about them. Have you ever, some of you have been there. Some of you have seen that. It is one of the most amazing things to behold. Somebody that has walked with Jesus for their whole life almost. And they have this truckload of peace that just sits on them in that moment. This is a true story. I was with a family and this amazing man of faith had been serving God for decades. Very sick. Hospice was involved for, for a while. And they brought the family in. I was able to get over there. And he was laying there and it was kind of dark. And uh, most people would say this is one of the most tense, gloomy times, but I, I didn't feel, I've never felt like that. 
I'm incredibly comfortable in that setting when it's a believer that's about to step into eternity. I'm incredibly comfortable. And so I said, let's just, let's just pray. And he was, his eyes were closed, and you would see his chest raise up just a little bit. And there was about five or six of us in there. The hospice worker stepped out. She's like, I'll let y'all pray. Hospice workers are great, by the way, if you know any of them. Man, they're fantastic. They're a blessing. And so we, there we were, and I was just like, let's just pray. And we prayed, and I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I kind of probably remember the effect of what I was saying. I'm just talking to Jesus because he's in the room as well. And just confronting the issue that this is a person that we care about, Lord, but you care about this person way more than we do. And it would be a great blessing. And wonderful for them if in this moment you would just you would just bring them home. And we said that, and there were tears in the room, and and I said amen, and we sat there for a second, and his chest didn't rise anymore, and that was it. And for a second I was like, man, did I just like take him out with that prayer? I didn't know, right? I mean, that was a it was a tense moment, but it was one of the most beautiful moments. I've ever experienced in my life in ministry. Here we are in a room with a saint of God who loves Jesus and has been walking with Jesus in this life through all the pain, all the stress of what the future is going to hold, just trusting Jesus, knowing Jesus, growing in Jesus. And here we are in that moment, and we're saying, Jesus, just let him see you right now, right now. And in, before we opened our eyes in prayer, his eyes were open and seeing Jesus face to face. So when we read this passage and we see that and we remind ourselves that Jesus is in charge of death, what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't say, well, oh, it would be insane for you to do this. We shouldn't say, well, man, I really miss, you know, so-and-so. And then you go over to the grave and, and like the, the cemetery and that. Don't do that. Don't think about people who have breathed their last in your life right now. Think about you. In your moment, because everybody in here, there will be a moment that you will breathe your last. There will be a moment that you will breathe your last. And I am thankful that Jesus, in this moment of, this is a critical moment in this family. This girl is dead. This is not a joking manner. But this is Jesus who is in charge and has supreme authority over death, walks into the room and says, hey, y'all got to get out of here for a minute. I have business to do. I'm going to shut the mouth of death really quick. And this girl rose up. So when I think about my future, I have to remind myself, Jesus is in charge of the future, your future, my future. When I think about the moment of death in my life, I read this and I and I'm reminded of the hope that I have in Jesus, the peace that I can have in Jesus. Because Jesus is hope in the midst of any despair. Jesus is life in the midst of facing death, facing real death. Jesus is life. You don't have to be afraid of death. If you're in Christ, if you're a believer, you don't have to fear death at all. Your future's decided. Your death is in the hands of the sovereign Savior who is in charge of death. Praise God. Jesus just takes her by her hand and she gets up. Jesus is in charge of death. Jesus is in charge of disability. The next one, Matthew 8 or Matthew 9, 27 through 31. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him crying aloud. And I don't know, and here's the thing culturally speaking, if you were disabled, you were worthless in first century AD. One of my best friends in high school broke his back 10th grade playing football, quadriplegic. He almost died twice. He didn't speak for like a year and a half after that. It was awful. It was a terrible injury. Today, he's my age, still a quadriplegic, but he's like the district attorney in uh, Lamar County. Like he's very well respected. He's in a, went to college, went to law school. Man, he killed it. He's doing great. Back then, if you were disabled or if you were blind, like, you were worthless. Even your family was like, okay, you're not really going to stay in here anymore. Go sit out in front of the, the house and 
That's all you could do. The only thing you could do is walk around and beg and hope, hope and somebody put a coin or a piece of bread in there and not some jerk kid put a little, you know, crusty, moldy something in your cup. Jesus is in charge of disability. And he passed on from there. These two blind men followed him crying out loud, Have mercy on us, son of David. There's a lot of people who are annoyed at these people. These people with this disability that are slowing the crowd down, that are annoying people. People want to see what Jesus, let, let's see the next spectacle. Let's see the next thing that Jesus performs. Let's see the next trick. And this blind guy who can't see is bumping into people, hollering, shut up, dude, go away. Like, go back to your little corner. Go back to your worthless little spot over there because you are full of just worthlessness. These blind men crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came in, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, it be done to you. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But they went on and spread his fame all throughout that district. Now, it's bizarre, I think, for some people. Like, Why did Jesus say that? He knew that they were going to go tell everybody. These guys are going to go see people that they've known for decades for the first time. You know what I mean? What are they going to do? I can't tell you. <laughs> are you like looking at me right now, man? What happened? Well, the guy that said this, he said not to say anything. Now they're telling everybody. Jesus is, Jesus is in charge of any type of disability. In fact, he, he, he like takes those broken people from the ash heap and he raises them up. Je and, and what this shows us, this doesn't show us that, hey, you know what, Jesus, what he's going to do in your life and in my life, that any time I ever have any kind of disability, he's just going to snap his finger and he's going to fix it. What this shows us is he is gentle in his mercy. He's merciful. He could look over these people. The king of the universe could look over a couple of worthless blind people and be like, I'm sorry, I don't have time for you. Shows us that he's merciful. They cry out, have mercy on us, and he does, and he heals them. I don't know if you feel like you have any type of hang-up, disability, shortcoming, physically, emotionally, mentally. Jesus, when, when we say he's in charge of disability, I want you to understand, like, he, he understands your ache. He understands your pain. He cares. And so what happens oftentimes is we feel like we got something that's kind of like blocking our way in, whatever, in, in something. And we, it's bugging us. We feel like it's impeding on something in our life. And in a way, if that's true, then what that is is like a disability in our life. And so here's what happens to a lot of people. Even Christians who've been walking with Jesus, what they do is they forget to pray about that. They've prayed about it a few times. So you might have something in your life, that's like a hang-up that you've had, and you're like, you maybe you've never really prayed about it a whole lot. You've just been like, well, you know, if I start praying about it, then I'm just going to think about it, and it's going to make me sad. And I prayed about it a few times, and Jesus didn't fix it. You know what was great about these, th these blind men? They pushed through the crowd, and they were next to Jesus. Like, I want to meet these guys one day. And I don't want to talk. I don't, when I meet these guys in heaven one day, I'm not going to be like, hey, tell me what it was like for seeing for the first time. Like, was it really, like, when, like, when it's dark and I go outside and it's bright, like, my eyes are, like, adjusting. Was it like you had to adjust because you hadn't seen for 40 years and you open your eyes for the first time? Was it like, really? I'm not going to ask them about anything like that. What was it like to first, first see color? I'm going to be like, what was it like to be near Jesus? What was, it, what was it like to be near him? He was calm and loving and gentle and merciful to me. So we all, we're all blind. In our own way, all of us are blind. And in our own way, all of us can go up to the sovereign king of the universe and beg for mercy. And in whatever way, what if Jesus opens your eyes? He can do that. He still can do that. And that doesn't mean that some of you who have glasses, you can leave here today and never need your glasses. Um, I wish. It'd be great. Jesus is in charge of disability. Jesus is in charge of the devil. That's a touchy subject. I said last week, what happens culturally and what happens in our mind when we think of like authority and the authority of Jesus, we have these like mental images of like Satan's in one corner and he's after the way in and he's been warming up and Jesus is over here and he's been warming up and let's see who's going to win. No, it's not like that. There's no competition. There's a song that came out a long time ago 
can't remember what it was. I think it was called the champion or something like that. And it was like this, this match that it was like in one corner. Like I'm like, what in the world is that? Like Jesus just picks up the whole ring and says, no, that's not gonna, we're not going to have a match today. He's in charge of the devil. And as they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the, demon was, had, was, when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never has anything like this seen before in Israel. But the Pharisees, rah, 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 these religious leaders, they said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. So here's what we need to understand. When we see Jesus casting out demons and like putting them in their place, you don't need, and I said it last week, don't overthink, like try to, some, try to get to where, oh, you're, you're making everything about some kind of demonic activity. Because I think Satan probably wants you to do that. Here's what you need to do. You need to look at this and say, Jesus defeated Satan on earth. Jesus will finally destroy Satan for eternity. Because I've read the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Jesus wins. He was winning then. He's going to win later. And that's my future. We win because I've read the end of the book. Okay? And so when we look at this, we'd be like, okay, Jesus is in charge of demons. Like, they, they shudder when he shows up. And here's what's great about being a believer. Not just these things of him being in charge of our future and all these things, which are wonderful to be reminded of. That he is in charge. Like, we're on his team. Like, these demon-possessed people, like, they don't, like we don't step back at, like, if, it's, if we're in this moment, we're, we're not like, oh, what do we do? No, we get a little closer to Jesus. And we're like, I'm on his team. I'm with him. I've seen what happened to the pigs last time. I was there following around. And those pigs went, Pew. And they, they were afraid. Everybody in the whole community was afraid of those guys that had those demons. And Jesus would be like, man, y'all are demons in a blanket. Pigs in a blanket. Go. Over. Done. I'm on, I'm on team Jesus, and he's in charge. He's in charge of everything. That's the shirt I wear. That's the jersey I wear. That's, on, that's the team that I'm on. And I'm reminding myself, these two weeks, I'm reminding myself that Jesus is in charge of everything. Everything in your life, everything in my life, he's in charge. So what's the main point when you look at Matthew 8 and 9? It goes on in, in uh, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues the gospel, showing people the truth of who he is, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. When he sees you right now, he's got compassion for you. You're not overlooked. There's been times in my life spiritually where I'm like, I feel overlooked. God, I feel like I'm overlooked. And then, like, if I have something going on in my life, like, I don't really want to bring it up. I don't really want to pray about it. Because there's other people that have other things going on, too. Well, now I'm telling God to overlook me. God doesn't want to overlook us. He loves us. And he saw these crowds. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he is the good shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. What he's saying here is he's saying, hey, all this authority, a while ago, you remember me saying, hey, you're on my team? All of that authority, I, I, I printed you out a little card. You can put it in your back pocket. And you can pull it out and remind yourself, hey, I'm on team Jesus. I have nothing to fear. No worry." I'm with him. He's with me. He has all authority. That's my leader. And wherever he leads, that's where I'll go. It might be dangerous. It might be, in the, it might be taking a huge step of faith. Everybody in my life might be like, are you sure about that? I've been there. And why do we do that? Because he's worthy. He's good. He's in charge. He is rejected, but he's also followed. He's the greatest leader. He's at the top of the list. But you and I also have read stories about bad leaders. Maybe you've heard of Charles VI of France. He thought he was made of glass. You know that? He actually thought he was made of glass. Caligula, he was a wacky, wacky Roman emperor. He declared war on the moon and marched a whole platoon of, of troops over a cliff. You've heard of Nero, Vlad the Impaler. The reason he's called Vlad the Impaler is because he impaled thousands of people. It was fun for him. Ivan the Terrible was terrible. Mao, if you ever heard of him, there's this great Chinese famine that happened in China where 45 million Chinese people died of starvation because of his rule. 
Stalin, man, terrible leader. There's, there's a guy, his nickname is the Butcher of Uganda. You can look him up. Awful leader. Uganda is still a terrible place. A lot to do with this Amin Butcher of Uganda. Talk about this Kim guy in North Korea. Pol Pot, you ever heard of him? Communist Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. Terrible. I hadn't even said Hitler. So we can, we, can, we can study like good leaders. And we know what bad leaders are. But here's what we have to be reminded of. Jesus is our leader and he is in charge. It doesn't matter what's going on. So the question ought to come up in this conversation. It ought to come up. If Jesus is absolutely sovereign and he's good, then why? Why do I still suffer from fill in the blank? Why is there still horrible things that go on in our world? Jesus is good. If he's in charge, if he's strong, if he's able, then why? I think it's a great thing. I think that's a great question to ask. I've, I've told you before, like, don't be afraid to ask God questions. Because for crying out loud, you might get an answer, and that'd be good. Why? I think that'd be a great question to ask God. Why? These past two weeks, God, have been tangled up with these thoughts. And, and what we're hearing, Jesus, is you, should, you are absolutely, completely, and fully sovereign. So God could supernaturally change everyone's personality and brainwash everyone. He could do that if he wanted to so that they would never sin and they would only love him and worship him. What is, that would kind of look like some of those horrible leaders that were trying to... That wouldn't be a loving relationship. God doesn't want to brainwash you and force you to love him. God wants to have a a joyful, loving relationship with you. When, when, when you wake up in the morning, you embrace Jesus as your friend, as your king, as your savior, and you want to walk with him. God could supernaturally intervene with every evil intention if he wanted to. He could. Whether it's the drunk driver, he could steer his car off to the side, and whether it's the addict, the drug addict father, the bully that's bullying all the smart kids, the thief, the gunman that runs in the wherever. God could supernaturally intervene with every evil intention on this planet. He could. Why could he do that? Because he has absolute total authority. That sounds great until he infringes on something that we got going on. Yeah, I want you to do that out there, God, but I don't want you to always want to do this visible. Either. God could supernaturally remove evil from every corner of the world today. He could. A sovereign God of the universe that has absolute control of everything could do that. And that might sound good, but what if we say you should start in this room? You, you can start in this room, God. You can wipe out all evil and start in here. Anybody walking out of here tonight? I'm going to be the first one to tell you. If, if, if I play that game with God, I'm going to be lying on this carpet. Roll me up. and We're going to have to call somebody else in here because y'all laying where you're sitting too. Look, I get it. It's hard. The world we live in is tough. But we need to be reminded of who's actually in charge. Jesus is in charge. He's the cure. He cares. God is restraining some evil in this world. He is currently doing that. God does have a plan to completely wipe out every sliver of evil in this world. The plan is there in place. Today what we have is a faith that we can grab a hold of and walk daily with the sovereign king of the universe that really cares, that's in charge. And I said last week, if that's true, then we can trust him. We can trust him wholeheartedly. We can rest peacefully in him. God, he hasn't, there's, nothing has slipped his, his mind. Nothing has gone past him. Nothing has been like, oh, well, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, I didn't know where that came from. Because he's completely sovereign. We can submit to him completely. That's why I'm saying, look, if, 
if, if you're hearing these, la- these, these recent sermons, these last two, like what you should say is, you should be like, wow, Jesus really is completely sovereign. Maybe I need to consider an area of my life that I need to submit more to him. Maybe I need to rejoice more in him. Maybe I need to rest more in him. Maybe I need to just trust him more daily. Here's what you can do. And I've tried this this week, and it's been really neat. I've, I've adjusted some of the things that I've prayed about this week based on our conversation tonight and last week. And I would start some prayers like this. Jesus, you are in charge. You are good. And then I would fill in the blank. Write that down. Think about some of the stuff that you got twirling around in your head that maybe you're arguing with somebody really close to you about or start your prayer about that and say, Jesus, you are in charge and you are good. And then I I, I prayed for my spouse this week, starting like that. I prayed for all of my kids. I prayed for every one of you. I prayed for our church. Jesus, you're in charge and you're good. Can you see how that's a great step of faith in a moment of prayer and closeness with Jesus? You're near. You're good. You're in charge. My future, I'm concerned about, God. My neighbors, my coworkers. You know, the people that you want to, like, grab their throat sometimes? Maybe you got a little bit of bitterness going on there. Jesus, you're in charge. You are good. Give me patience with this person. Give me a, a, an opportunity to care for them or encourage them. Jesus today still is completely in charge. Still. He was then. He still is today. And you know what's amazing about his moment that, that he was actually sent to this earth for? The sovereign king of the universe came to die. To be brutally slaughtered publicly, shamefully, in the most horrific way. We want to talk about horrible things happening in our world. The worst event that ever happened in the history of mankind is the brutal public crucifixion of the only perfect person that ever lived. And he volunteered. That's the worst thing that ever happened. And God took the worst thing that ever happened and made it the best thing that ever happened. And Jesus broke the bonds and the chains of death, exploded out of the tomb in victory, and he looks at us, blazing eyes, looks at our heart tonight and says, I'm in charge still. You're with me. You're with me. So we can live. So we can have hope. So we can face the darkest days, knowing that we are never alone, that our future is secure, and we can have hope and peace and forgiveness, joy, all those Because Jesus is in charge. We're going to close and we're going to have a time of prayer. Here's what I want you to do. We've talked a lot in the past couple of days just about how Jesus is in charge. Take that little statement. Jesus, you're in charge. Jesus, you are good. And pray about some stuff that maybe you haven't dared pray about yet. Maybe you're scared to pray about it. Or maybe you're like, well, I don't know if I should mention this. There's... So many other things that I should be praying about. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm like that a lot. If I got something going on in my life that I want to pray about, a lot of times what happens is I end up praying about somebody else for something. So take this moment. Jesus, you're in charge. Jesus, you're good. What do you need to pray? Now, maybe you're in here tonight, and you're, you've been kind of on the edge for a long time. What you need to do tonight is you need to say, Jesus, I realize for the first time you're in charge and you're good and you want me to be close to you. You want to save me. You want me to step next to you and walk with you the rest of my life, this journey of faith. Okay, I'm ready. You need to pray that. And then come to me later on. Come to me and say, hey, I remember what I said. But I was basically like, Jesus, you're in charge. Jesus, you're good. I'm in. Like, tell me that. Like, I want to talk with you about that first initial step of faith in your life. That's a great place for you to be. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. 
and you've slipped off the path, this, this path of trusting in his goodness and his sovereignty. Hey, get back on. Get back on that path. Get back on there. He's sovereign. He's good. I'm going to close in prayer. You spend some time, a few minutes, and then I'm going to come back up and close. Bradley's in the nursery tonight, so I'm going to close this evening. Thank you.